we look at dolphins and the way they're, they've adapted and the way they've evolved in their environment, they're beautifully adapted and very intelligent, even by our standards. So what we do is we often look at animals and we give them similar kinds of tests that we may give ourselves, that we give children or adults. And one of those tests is a test called mirror self-recognition. For a long time, we used to think that, that our ability to recognize ourselves in the mirror to get up in the morning and walk in front of into your bathroom mirror and see that face and know that face is mine and perhaps be really disappointed or happy when you see that um, is is a uniquely human attribute. But we found out several many years we found out we discovered many years ago that we're not alone in this capacity. That other species, our closest relatives, the great apes, can also recognize themselves in the mirror. This may seem trivial, but it's, it's actually fairly complex. I did studies with my colleague, Dr. Laurie Marino from Emory University many years ago showing dolphins, as different as they are, living in this very different environment, also have this very rare and high cognitive capacity. We know the science, and we know these animals are intelligent. We know they're sentient. We know they can experience great pain and suffering. And one of the issues that it comes forth immediately is the ethical issue. What do we do if we know that these animals are intelligent? I've been working to try to stop a, a terrible and very inhumane killing of dolphins that goes on in Japan every year from September through May. And it's called the Dolphin Drive. They're called the Dolphin Drives. Um, I became aware of this after I published my paper on mirror self-recognition, people who had been working to stop this situation approached me and asked me if I would speak out about this. When I found out about it, I could hardly believe what I was seeing. And since 2001, I've been working diplomatically and politically trying to convince the Japanese government to put an end to this because it's so inhumane. We got nowhere. After going to the embassy in Japan, they just turned a blind eye. Finally, I was very fortunate to meet Louis Sahoyas, who was the director of the Cove at a marine mammal conference where I was giving a talk about this. And I begged him to do a film about this, thinking the only way we would bring an end to this drive is by having it recognized publicly, because this was a deep, dark secret that the Japanese were hiding from the rest of the world. You can't get in there to film. And I felt that this was the only way people would do something about it if enough people saw it, if enough people in Japan found out, and we could make a change from within as well. So I'm very, very happy that this film was made. What happens in, the, in this dolphin drive hunt, as it's called, and it is a hunt, and it is a slaughter, and it's very graphic when you see it. On, 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 let me try to explain it. Fishermen go out to sea in boats, and generally there are a few boats that head out into the open ocean, and they round up, they find groups of dolphins. These are very, these are highly social groups with mothers and calves and, and animals of different ages that stay together because they're dependent on each other for their survival. They bang on pipes that they hold over the boat, and by banging on these pipes, they create an acoustic net or an acoustic barrier out at the sea that, and they use this just like they might use a physical net to move the dolphins into a very small cove in Taiji. This, this method is called the Oikomi method, and I know it well because I used this in the rescue of a big humpback whale in San Francisco many years ago. We used it for good purposes, so I know exactly how it works. Dolphins will move away from sound barriers like this. So once they're herded and rounded up, they're moved into this lagoon in this bay where they can be kept for a few days, a few hours, or they can be killed fairly quickly. What the fishermen do now is they tie the individual animals by their tails and have them fairly well immobilized on the, on the beaches. They used to eviscerate them by slitting their stomachs. And you'd see these animals, I don't want to get too graphic here, but people should hear what really happens. They were ripped apart, eviscerated, and they would be flailing. I, I watched an animal 15 minutes for 15 minutes flailing, struggling for its life with blood spurting out. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to believe any human being could do this to another being, be it a human or an animal. Um, and now what they're doing is because of the controversy that, and the footage of the, co the coverage of the cove where you see these lagoons filled with blood of these animals, what they're doing now is they're wrapping their tails, holding them immobilized, and then they take a metal rod and shove it into their heads. So th they think that they're rendering them 
unconscious or dead, but they're not. It's actually the most horrific thing you've ever seen. And with the dolphin, their brains are organized in such a way that they're, what they're doing is they're damaging their brains. Functionally, you have an animal that's alive with its brain damaged, and, it's, and if anything, it's been immobilized. This is horrendous. Once they do that, they're now hammering in wood spikes, wood stakes, into the hole that they've created so the blood doesn't flow out into the ocean. These are harvests that are the most inhumane treatment of animals. You couldn't treat a mouse like this in a laboratory. I can tell you for a fact, mice are protected from being killed in front of other mice, and it has to be done humanely. There are, there's all sorts of, uh, there are all sorts of uh, laws to protect farm animals. They're not always the best yet, but they're getting better. So this is a case that is so extreme. And to be seeing this happen with these extremely intelligent animals is unbelievable. So as a scientist, I feel that it's my responsibility to be speaking out and working as an advocate in this arena now. Thank you.